Well, good afternoon. Um, welcome everyone. Very excited to hold this, our path, STEM Pathways conversation. Um, my name is Muriel Fox Lee. I am with the National Math and Science Initiative. I serve as the Director of Programmatic Partnerships um, and am very pleased to have with us today, Arthur Mitchell. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about, about Arthur uh, and I'll let him kind of you know, share some more. So um, Arthur is the executive director for the STEM Equity Alliance, which is a nonprofit dedicated to, for, to three different goals. Um, one, creating systems where STEM subjects are taught using culturally responsive pedagogical approaches, um, being able to increase diversity of STEM educators, as well as create a more durable STEM pipeline for groups which are typically underrepresented in STEM career fields. So we're really very excited to, to have Arthur with us today. Um, he is an educator at heart, right? He has served in K-12 education for many years. Um, and he has worked both in, in, in some of the most impoverished urban, as well as the most affluent suburban districts um, across the country. And in, it is from his experience that has really stemmed the work that he does um, with the Equity Alliance. He <clears throat> has been an active voice for, for underserved populations and a change agent for issues of equity and access, especially, you know, obviously in STEM education. Um, we want to welcome you, Arthur, to this conversation, and it will be a conversation. So, you know, I, I, I think we talked a little bit before, and we said that I have questions, but, um, you know, I really want this to, to be a, a conversation. Um, and let's kind of begin. Okay. Um, if you could share with us, Arthur, just some, some words around, you know, your sort of your, your origin story. We laughed a little bit about that, like the stem of that question, um, your origin story. Like what, what is it as a young person you enjoyed about STEM? Did you even realize as a young person that that was a thing, right? Um, and and what, what has led you into the work that you do? Well, uh, first I just wanna say thank you for having me. Um, this is humbling to be on this platform, sharing with um, an audience in this way, um, being able to talk about myself, the work of the STEM Equity Alliance, um, and just uh, STEM education and underserved communities in general. Um, yeah, so the, the, the backstory or the origin story, uh, it was funny, the first time I saw that, you know, I'm a, uh, my inner geek comes out a little bit and start thinking the all the superhero shows and now everyone has a backstory show. Um, so so the backstory uh, and you know, part of these things, you know, um, being a, a native of Pittsburgh, so I'm, I'm in Philadelphia now, the Philadelphia area, but being from uh, Pittsburgh um, back in the 70s, I, I'm the youngest of eight children, right? Um, the next oldest sibling is uh, six years older than I am. So I kind of grew up almost like an only child in some mm -hmm. respects, but um, I was always following after my older siblings. And so because they were older, learning was always going on because they were in school. So, I mean, I, I kind of chased them after those things. I wanted to uh, be with them, be in their circles, um, you know, know the things that they knew. I, I remember being in you know, maybe like third grade or something like that, maybe fourth grade, and my sister was taking algebra. So I decided I was going to learn algebra too. It didn't work out well, but, you know, I, I wanted to do it because she was doing it. Um, and so my, my older siblings definitely had that type of influence on me. Um, and they, because they were always learning, I was exposed to what was going on in their worlds. Um, and so the, you know, the, the science piece, uh, what they were doing, the questions they were answering and uh, asking and uh, the types of projects and things they were working on, um, always, you know, it sparked a natural curiosity in me. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, like I said, being the youngest, I had, had a lot of free time. <laughs> and so I did a lot of exploration on my own. Um, the area where we lived, there was nothing around but um, uh, the woods and trees and other things that I could explore. Um, we had a nice size yard, so everything was always an adventure. Um, you know, my, my older brother, he had chemistry sets and, you know, these engineering sets. And so I'd follow after him and fashion myself as uh, 
some type of mad scientist trying to mix some concoction. I think I almost killed myself one time by making some noxious gas in the bathroom. But, you know, but it was that type of exploration process. Um, and then also, I think uh, just hearing and knowing um, the, the stories that, you know, there was a, a, a history that was uh, formally and informally taught in my house. Um, you know, so I, I knew, of course, the, you know, we, we had all the posters and the, the, um, the, the disco famous Black Americans right, posters right. And, and those types of things in the house. Uh, and, and those were common conversations. Uh, my, my parents, we were, um, and my, my family, we were around people who were making history uh, mm -hmm. quite often. Um, I, I do have the advantage of you know, not being- My father is a, is a trailblazer, so- you Yeah, know, you, know, we'll... yeah it, you know, our, our parents are trailblazers and, and they walked in some very um, special circles. Absolutely. And um, you know, on both sides of my family, I'm not a first generation college student. So I had that uh, type of background experience. I mean, and, and you know, my, part of my motivation, even in STEM, was my my mother's uh, youngest brother was a doctor, and I, um, you know, just like everyone else, when I went away to college, you know, as a as a uh, life science major, I had planned to go to med school, and um, <laughs> I found out really quickly. Um, I went to a seminar freshman year and found out that uh, med school wasn't for me because uh, I only wanted it because I, I liked his lifestyle. <laughs> mm. I, I really didn't want to help people through medicine. Okay. And so I had to reevaluate something uh, at that point. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, prior, prior to that was really just a lot of the experiences that helped me build that type of curiosity. Uh, mm. And in Pittsburgh at that time, um, you know, I was in a, the gifted and talented program. Uh, I went, you know, one day a week to a pull out program where I got special things that my classmates weren't getting. And I realized that I had some experiences and some opportunities that they didn't have. But unfortunately, I was not able to share that with my classmates because I was pulled out one day a week to go to this special place. Right. Um, but, but it did shape me and help me to grow and grow my curiosity around uh, science in particular. Yeah. So you, you, you said a couple of things there that I kind of want to circle back to. Um, one, you know, one is, uh, you know, around your, 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 upbringing, um, the exposure that you had. And it sounds like, and there was an expectation that was set that you, you know, you will go in a, you, you, you will excel, right? Um, and it sounds as if your family then put you in situations where you had that opportunity. 100%. Um, there definitely was that expectation. Uh, I actually didn't know that college was not a choice. I, I, that wasn't something that was ever really on the table for me. I, it was- What you did school, after high school. Right? Go to college, right. This is the succession. And then you go, you know, you, you do your thing. You're institutionalized. You go from one institution to the yeah. next, to the next. Um, but uh, so, yeah, that, that was just the way that, that I thought. Uh, that was what was always presented to me. And because that's what was presented to me, that's how I operated. And then, as I said, the, the schooling process, um, you know, it wasn't for, you know, until I got to high school that I really, really realized the special opportunities I had in being in a gifted and talented program and then starting an honors program in a magnet school early on in, you know, seventh grade. Um, that, you know, starting in seventh grade, I, I was in a separate school, even though I was in school. So, right. you know, my classmates and I had a different experience than everyone else. And there was a different set of expectations for us than everyone else. Um, and because we had those experiences and those expectations, we just marched along knowing what our end was supposed to be and that was college and then beyond. Um, and, and so, and my, and my family definitely had a very strong role in that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have been in those programs if it wasn't for my, my parents, my mother, uh, who was an educator as well, um, making sure that I, uh, had those opportunities, make my, my father ensuring, you know, that I um, was doing what I was supposed to, and I was kicked out of school for misbehavior and all those other pieces that uh, you know, may have happened along the way. But it it was, um, yeah, it was just what was understood in the family, and right. so I, I don't take that for granted that right. um, that I had that uh, had that to stand on. Yeah, and that's interesting um, that you talk about that. So you know, when I think about, you know, we, we, we talked about the connection, right, the connection that we have both being from Pittsburgh, um, 
essentially sort of our, our families sort of in very similar circles as we, as the two of us, you know, were, were growing up. And, and I think about like my origin story, while I am not, I guess I am a STEM educator. Let me, let me, let me, <laughs> let me rephrase that. You are, we, we, I, we, we bring you in, you're part thank of Thank you. Story. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, that invitation. Um, but my parents didn't go to college, right? So, um, and I too, very similar to you, had a big gap, right, as, as in, in, in my siblings. And for you, it was six. For me, it was 12 years difference. So it really was, I was, just, I was an only child. Um, but I know one of the things, despite them not going to college, it still was an expectation for me to have that as an opportunity to be poised to have that option, um, as well as it being an expectation. Um, and I think for, for, for me, despite them not going to college, they grew up in an era where, as you mentioned, um, the, 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 the black people that they were around were professionals um, right. who were, were, were poised and recognized for, for, for what they brought um, you know, to the table. But I wanna think about like, for, for, those, for those children who do not, mm -hmm. you know, who did not have the opportunities um, that you and I sort of speak to as far as well, let me say this. Every parent wants their child to be successful. Correct. Right? <laughs> um, every child wants, I mean, every parent wants their child to have opportunities. Not all parents know how to give them those opportunities or even have that as an option. Yes. So, so like, what, what, is, what is it then that we need to be doing from your perspective to make sure that <sighs> That is that, that it's there. That it's so. So when we don't have the you know that gifted and talented program, that pull out option for a student because she doesn't qualify for whatever whatever the qualifications are, how do we make sure that she has that she has that op that that opportunity? Yeah, you know that was that was the sit back moment for me. I had to take a deep breath when you started uh, you know thinking about that question. Um, you know when when I think about and talk to parents. Um, of course, I'm very STEM centric, you know, that, that is who I am, what I do. Um, but I, I, I don't think that I uh, oversell the importance of STEM. You know, um, we, we still mean? know no, that- Tell me what that means. What does that well, mean? That, that math is still a limiting factor, right? Okay. Um, if students are not on a trajectory early in life, chances are they may not get on that pathway through the formal educational system, that K-12 system, because the system is not designed to onboard people. The system is designed to funnel and to move people out of uh, the highest levels of opportunity. There is a design there. You know, I, I, I've um, changed my language a lot. And, you know, when people talk about systems being broken, I, 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 the school system isn't broken. It is poorly designed or it is designed to get the outcomes that we get and the outcomes that we get are that's a that. scientific approach that's very yes, scientific it's, it's an engineering approach right yeah. so it, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. it is a design factor um that black and brown children are systematically underserved in systems and we're okay with that and so i talk to parents about whether or not they understand that first of all and second what their power is in helping their children to stay on a track to get to where they want to go so that all options are open for them. I, I think that STEM at the K-12 level is about keeping options on the table. Um, and we're often, and I say we, black and brown families are often coached out or um, assisted out of the highest levels of math and science that are available. Mm -hmm. And when we think about being competitive uh, to go into whatever you want to do, um, be it college or career, when we mm -hmm. think about being able to really make informed decisions and choices, then you need to keep all parts of education on the table for as long as possible in order to be able to have those choices. Uh, I describe it, you know, often this way, that if when a child enters kindergarten, you know, all things being equal, you know, A through Z are the career choices on the table. Um, for a lot of black and brown children who are in urban settings and, and places where, which are under-resourced, uh, by that time they get to like eighth grade, then we've gone from A to Z down to like, you know, A through J, 
<laughs> as as real career options. Yeah, I was gonna say A through D. I was gonna say I wasn't yeah. well, going first J, but yeah. Well, but but by the time we get to high school, we're probably down to like A through F. Mm -hmm. And it is not because of the child's limitations. It's because this is what the system has done by not offering things or by focusing on basic educations, by doubling down on, well, we need to focus on literacy and literacy only meaning reading, not literacy meaning literacy across the curriculum. And uh, literacy hijacks the curriculum in a way that we can't learn to read in anywhere else. You know, We can't learn to read in our science class or in our social studies class. It is only taking place in a literacy English language arts class. Right. Uh, and so we're not even maximizing the opportunities the students have to develop the multiple literacies that they need. Um, so it, it is really about demanding that those things be kept on the table and asking those questions and being informed to ask those questions and being brave enough to ask those questions. Right. So many of our parents uh, may have not have had a positive experience. They may have had, you know, some people have anxieties going back in. Uh, they, they, you know, when it, when it comes to math, and I'm not beating up on math, but just using it as the uh, real core example that it is, a lot of people have math anxieties and math mm -hmm. phobias, and this had horrible experiences because the math enterprise uh, is one that selects people out mm -hmm. instead of maintaining uh, a type of inclusivity that's necessary for all people to move forward, every learner to move forward. And so a parent can't say, well, I wasn't a good math student, so it's okay that my child is not a good math student. The, 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 uh, that script needs to be flipped to, I wasn't a good math student, therefore I'm going to ensure that my child is a good math student. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ensure that the system is doing everything necessary to get my child to the highest level they can go so that A through Z stays on the table as career choices. Mm -hmm. And it really is about being able to make a choice in what you want to do, not being able to only make a choice of a few things because that's all that's left on the table for you or that's what the system has told you that you should be able to do. That there are options, there are only options. Yeah. So, so if, how, how, tell me a little bit then how the work that you are doing, um, that you do helps to do that. Like you know, what, what, how, how is the work that you're doing um, helping to communicate that to, to folks? Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, so, you describe me being a you know career long educator, and I, I've shifted. You know, I'm in like career 4.0 at this point, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Because I was a teacher, and you know, as a a high school science teacher, uh, I've been an administrator um, at multiple levels, at the school district level, at the, you know, being a, in the curriculum offices, um, at the state level, at the county level. So I've done that type of work as well, mm -hmm. and um, so. In that more direct work, of course, I worked within those school systems, working with my colleagues, working with teachers, uh, other administrators in order to um, create conditions. And it really was about creating conditions for uh, all students to learn and really focusing in on those who were most vulnerable in the system or those that the system wasn't serving uh, as well as it should. You know, okay. so, so the data, what the data would tell us, uh, we, we would go look at those data and say, hey, you know, we, we see these um, the, these opportunities here, and I'll, I'll call it an opportunity because if there is a gap or a deficit, then there's an opportunity for growth. How do we fill that opportunity uh, from a professional standpoint? What does the system do? If we haven't done everything we ha can do as a system, right. then we're not serving the, our clients well. Um, and, and so that was the focus when I was at that space. Okay. Um, as I've moved on to you know, where I am now with the STEM Equity Alliance and other work that I do. Um, it really is about working with those larger systems now. Uh, so working at uh, with state departments of education and helping them to create the conditions. But part of it is changing conversations and changing targets. Uh, the, the name of my organization, the STEM Equity Alliance, is, is, is very intentional because the equity focus uh, it is really primarily what we're, we're what we're talking about at this point, and you know, so we use that graphic, uh, you know, about the difference between equality and equity, okay, and okay. you know, equality is that you know 1.0 lowest hanging fruit that everyone just gets it, everyone gets a piece. Um, we're going to ensure that everyone has the access to and the right to get into a certain course. Um, you know, the equality, I mean, the, the the equity instead of the equality is now we're going to ensure that you can thrive in that system. Mm -hmm. We're gonna make sure that you have what you need for success in that place that we allowed you 
or uh, that you were, uh, you know, took the opportunity to go into. If we can't uh, create conditions for success, then equality doesn't mean much because then we're setting you up for failure in a system that you should have the ability to thrive in. Okay. Um, so it, when equality versus equity was explained to me early on, it was uh, equality means that everyone gets a coat, equity means that everyone gets a coat that fits. Mm -hmm. And in, in education, getting systems to really understand and start from that standpoint, do we have an equity-based system? If we don't have an equity-based, equity-focused, culturally competent system, if that's not our orientation, if that's not our lens, if that's not how we see the world and what we do, then we're missing the mark yeah. because we will regress toward the mean, regress toward the middle and provide kind of that, that basic, here's what everyone, we're going to give everyone. But if you don't get it and you fall outside in the margins, sorry, we, we did what our uh, due diligence was in providing equality without focusing in on equity. Yeah. And often in education, those even equality and equity conversations are often relegated to the humanities. Yeah. And we think about um, you know, what it means to have representation and other things. You know, mm -hmm. So we, we have to make sure that our, our reading list is diversified and we have uh, enough black and brown and you know, uh, LGBTQ and, and Asian and immigrant and you know, whatever authors and representations in the work. And we're looking at this person's history and that person's history in a, in a uh, social studies class. But in STEM, you still have opportunity, the same types of opportunities, even though uh, we often think that we don't. Uh, it is through the examples, but it is also recognizing that the students are coming with a richness of experience. They're coming uh, to a classroom already with a whole set of ideas, with a schema that's been developed by their environment and where they are. And you're pulling those things out of them in order to use them for learning opportunities. You're actually using the community as a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. If we only, as educators, go into a community of poverty or a community that is under-resourced and we identify the students with the community, seeing them being one and the same, that we have these poor under-resourced kids coming from this poor under-resourced community, then we can't see the opportunities that present themselves in those communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that the students are actually going to be change agents for their community if we allow them to uh, tie their learning into making change in those places, which is what the real value of education is especially a STEM education that is tied into innovation and creating a whole innovation economy. Okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute, because you said a lot there. I know, I, I, so, I do that. So, so wait, so, so, so one follow-up question I wanted to ask you um, was around like a, a for example, right? The impact, and, 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 I, and I think you've given it, right? So this idea around, and, and, and at NIMSI, when we do our professional development for our teachers, um, they participate in, in um, a course that is, is designed around funds of knowledge, which is exactly what you've described there, right? Mm -hmm. Recognizing what your students bring to the table and leveraging that, right, to be able to, 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 to understand what's, you know, the, the, the content and, and really build their skills, right? So, so that, you know, I, I think I, I get that part. My question though is, is more around where, I mean, and, and maybe from your opinion, so this is all from your opinion, from your opinion, where, where do you feel is where we can make the greatest impact? So you, you talked about, you know, the classroom, you talk about the system, you talk about working at the district and even at the state level for this work. Is there a place where the greatest impact, like where we can make the greatest impact, and maybe there isn't, and you can talk about that, and or where you have seen that happen? Um, so the answer to the question is yes, <laughs> because it is all of the above. Uh, you know, this, this is, I, I love the fact that in, in the United States, we have, um, you know, the, the STEM Ecosystems Project that started a few years ago, and yeah, now yeah. you have across the country, all of these what are recognized as ecosystems can you know that we're connecting uh, all those providers everyone who's concerned with stem and stem education into a network of of resources that can be accessed within that region right so that that ecosystems approach is hugely important because the ecosystems approach allows us to get to the 
teacher classroom level. It allows us to get to the administrator, allows us to get to those who are going to be outside professional development providers. It allows us to get to the museums and, and the parks and other people who are going to help to uh, add some richness. It allows us to get to the corporate world who has a vested interest in ensuring that uh, the education system in which their uh, facilities are housed are world class and are doing transformative work. Uh, it allows us to get to the university space where we are pushing our students into that university space, but also out of that university space, we're developing teachers. Uh, and those teachers are gonna go back and impact classrooms. So uh, a systems approach or an, an, an ecosystems approach really is necessary. And it really is about intelligently thinking about all those pieces of that ecosystem. And from no matter where you are, you look at what your assets are and what your ecosystem looks like. Okay. And you pull on those resources in order to provide, um, you know, this type of world-class STEM education that in some places um, it's taken for granted because it just is, you know, so mm. I, you, know, you read my bio, I worked in one of the most affluent school districts uh, in Pennsylvania and it just was, we, we had every resource necessary to provide whatever we wanted for our students. Uh, I worked in a place that was not as resourced and it was a little bit different of a struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to provide that. And so what, what, what was in the affluent district, they could provide everything within the district. The district that was less, less affluent, we had to really lean on that ecosystem even more okay. in order to provide those resources and make those connections. But also because within that ecosystem are the examples and the people at, that, that provide the models for students to look at, to say, well, hey, I can do that too. I can be part of that. Even though that profession or that professional may not be in my community, I have access to someone like that because they've been brought into my education space formally in my classroom in an informal program that I'm working in, uh, in some other experience where I have access to people, hopefully people who look like me, so I can look at them, ask them questions and, and aspire to be who they are, even if that person isn't in my uh, familiar circle in my neighborhood or wherever the case may be. So okay. we have to operate at every level and okay. every level has a level of responsibility to equity and access uh, to you know, diversity. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big diversity guy in that diversity is really just an accounting thing. <laughs> we're we're, we're numbers. looking at numbers and who's there and the representation, right. but it's what we do in response to the diversity that really matters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I'm doing this work in STEM teacher diversity. Why do we want diverse STEM teachers? Well, at the lowest level people say, well, just because it's great having good models in front of the kids, that we want the kids to be taught by someone who looks like them. But, but for what? What does the research say around that? If the research says that there is an impact on that in, within that diversity, then that's what we pursue and pursue it vigorously. And what has shown up is that yes, for black and brown children, if they have someone who looks like them in a, in a classroom in front of them, their trajectory changes. But at the same time, if we have black and brown teachers in a system, all students get lifted by mm -hmm. that, that they have an impact for all students. And it's because we bring different things to the table, which are going to be wonderful assets for whatever system we're involved with. Mm -hmm. And so for STEM and for the STEM community to recognize that is hugely important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and often, you know, like I said, it, these are these, the, the issues around equity access, um, representation, uh, th those are difficult conversations in the STEM space because STEM professionals feel that their profession is, is you know, we're, 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 we are diversity agnostic. We don't care, but if we look around, we don't have a reason to describe why, uh, you know, it, it is a completely, uh, you know, monolithic endeavor, and right. we, we don't have any diversity in those spaces. Right. So, so again, a couple of things I'm, I'm hearing you say here, um, and it reminds me, we, you know, we, prior to get, jumping on the call, I, um, I, I, I mentioned um, Sharif al Meki to you, and I said, you know, do you have any, you know, relation to him? And, I, and I've heard, you know, one of the things that Sharif says is education should be a window to the opportunities that students have, as opposed to that mirror, right? You're, they should, so when you think about having, like you said, having having educators in front of you who look like you, yeah, that's great, but really education should be about what, what those opportunities are. How does the work then that you do um, 
move us in that direction. You, you, you talked about, you know, that equity lens and ha like that's a that's a huge like mindset shift for educators. I'm, uh, you know, we, we walk into the classroom, many of us, you know, I, I'm, I'm also, um, you know, I think about uh, Dr. Chris Emden and for, you know, the, his, his, the work that he's done for white folks, who, you know, who teach in the hood and, and the rest of y'all too. too. And the rest <laughs> of y'all too, right? We, we go in with, you know, these sort of lofty ideas, we're here to help, we're here to help, and we are. And then we get there and then we fall into this mindset. Mm -hmm. So, and what you're saying is, we will need to walk in with, you know, with with that caring attitude and with those glasses on. Yep. T and, talk a little bit about that and how your work is is helping to 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 address that. Um, so, in in STEM Equity, um, STEM Equity Alliance, you know, my partner, shout out to Cheryl Rush Dix up in Erie. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, we Cheryl and I we got together. You know, doing work with the Smithsonian, Smithsonian right. Science Education Center. We've been doing that work with them for years, and it started off with strategic planning. And so we were doing, uh, in, working in, um, you know, doing elementary, and then expanded out to K twelve strategic planning and science, and then in STEM. And that strategic planning is key. It's really important because if we don't have a STEM specific strategic plan then we tend to miss the mark in, in what happens in STEM. I mean, we really do need to call STEM out separately because it's resourced differently. Uh, the, the teacher professional development, the teacher, um, when it comes to you know, teacher recruitment or retention, th there are different issues there. We, you know, we, ha we have to differentiate in some ways. And so that STEM area is really important. Uh, but you know, one of the things that Sarah and I saw and that, that we uh, was challenging to us was that in, in strategic planning, um, it's great to start off with the areas that Smithsonian was focused on, but there was some backstory work we needed, right? There, there was some some front matter that needed to be loaded, and that front matter really started to has to deal with uh, equity and cultural competency, whether or not we have a lens around those things, whether or not we're viewing a system from those spaces, because uh, that helps us to understand one, you know, an, an equity journey starts with me and my own view, my own identity, how I see myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how I see other people connected to me based on how I see myself and how I see them. Okay. Um, you know, when you think of um, Lisa Delpit's book, you know, uh, Other People's Children, right? Mm -hmm. that, that whole other people's children notion is really important because if I'm not identifying and connecting with those students on that level that I can see them as mine, that they, mm -hmm. that they are that they are not just someone else's child that's coming to my classroom, but there is a connection there and I have a cultural connection. I understand who they are. If, if, if I don't know you, I can't teach you. I mean, that's a really important thing. And like I said, STEM is the exact same thing. If I don't believe that you have the ability, mm. if I don't believe that you're going to have a, an opportunity or a career in this, then it's easy for me to dismiss you. It's easy mm -hmm. for me to give you the lowest level of engagement and say that that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if I walk in with this lens that says, wow, I need to provide something for you that's going to get you to where you are, uh, have a choice of where you want to be able to go. That's an entirely different mindset. And the experiences that I'm going to provide, how I view myself as an educator in front of you is going to change in some ways because now I am valuing not just who you are, but also I'm valuing what you are going to become and then my ability to help to create that pathway for what you're going to become. Mm -hmm. um, so if I don't believe that you have a future, I'm not going to put much into you. Mm -hmm. If I do believe you have a future, then I'm going to, uh, you know, the exhaustion that I, that I will, you know, place myself into is an entirely different thing. It's not just the futile, I have a bunch of work to do. It's mm -hmm. I have intelligent work to do in order to bring this child from where they are to where they need to go next as I'm handing them off to another culturally competent colleague who okay. understands that we are connected in the types of experiences, not just the content, but in the minds that we're developing. Uh, you know, we, we've, we, we focus in on, you know, I was in a seminar the other day and I really appreciate uh, dividing learning versus development. And you know, we need to maintain a, a process that talks about development and brain development, what it means to help students to develop ideas and to be able to discuss and talk about ideas and to and how that constructivist uh, mindset where they're investigating and raising questions and then, uh, you know, uh, being able to discuss those things and, 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 and have rich discussions with their peers is, is a value 
And it's not just, can I perform on a standardized test? Can I perform even on the low level, poorly designed classroom assessment that you designed by yourself and not with a group of colleagues? Right. So right. looking at that equity and cultural competency lens at the very beginning and understanding that it, that is a growth journey. It is not, I'm flipping on a switch and now I am uh, equity minded and culturally competent. I have to continue to deconstruct who I am, deconstruct those experiences, reconstruct them in ways uh, that helps help me to make meaning and help the students to make meaning so that now we're in a different type of relationship. Okay. Um, and, and in that relationship, we both have responsibility in order for that growth to occur. And I'm growing as a professional. I see myself growing as a professional with every cohort of students that I become involved with. So okay. that's the front end. We have the traditional stuff in the middle where we focus on, you know, curriculum, professional development, you know, all those other things. But then those targets that I already alluded to, do I really believe that this student has the ability to be a change agent, that these students have the ability to transform their communities, that they have the ability to step into an economy that I, that I can't even really vision well, that they can vision better than I am, uh, better than I can, uh, that they are going to not just had, uh, earn a living wage and a, a family sustaining wage, but that they can really be the giants of you know a change in industry that right. that um, you know that I know that that they can be you know. So do I have a uh, do I know what's happening in the regional economy? Do I know what the jobs are? Do I know what those forecasts look like? Do I know what the regional assets are? Do I have a good understanding of uh, how the neighborhood was developed and what's there and you know? How, how those students can impact You're change in the neighborhoods. Right I know, I'm asking people to do a lot. lot. I'm asking right people now. to, right, professional educators, professional, right, that professional educator. Yeah. I'm putting the, that professional piece there really solidly real. because real. it's, and, and it's not just all on the classroom teacher. It is on the system to create the, the expectations and provide the resources and for the resources teacher. i was about to say and the resources the resources, and the resources are really very important for that um and i'm glad i'm glad you're you know you're putting that emphasis on 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 the professional part of professional educator because again you know when, when i think about how our work um your your work with with the stem equity alliance aligns with what with with the national math and science initiative does is you know we you you, you start you know, often <laughs> Um, when when people sort of get to um, certain levels of you know of um, professional life, and particularly in education, um, we we look at it in this sort of you start out as a teacher, then you become a you know a school administrator, then you become right. a, like so this sort of hierarchical professional. Right. Can, can I put a pin in that for you real quickly? Oh, I'm, okay, I'm pin it pin for a second because I'm gonna come back to it. But go oh, back. Hold on to it. Yeah, because. Even that trajectory that you're talking about, um, because I was a classroom teacher, you know, so taught in um, you know, was a district that was majority black and brown and district that was majority white. Um, when I stepped out of the classroom and went into that professional space, you know, mm -hmm. at, at a state department of education, you know, so on Friday I had 100 students, on Monday I had 1.2 million students I was mm. responsible for. It was like that type of right. role. This is it's like big time. This is a big deal. Um, when I got into the, those spaces with my content professionals, I was the only person who looked like me. Wow. That there were not other people of color who were involved in content leadership. Mm -hmm. they, these were the people who were making decisions by and large about what was going to happen within the state or nationally. And there was no representation. You know, you had, we had these closed doors and, you know, often when I step into the room, then all eyes are turned on me. Oh, now we can talk about equity arts here. Like, the arts no, here. yeah, yeah. I can't be the face of that. I can't be the impetus for this discussion. And I can't be the one who's going to be the representative of all things black. That's that's not me. I can represent what I know, my experiences and, you know, uh, the, the perspectives that I'm bringing, the baggage that I'm bringing as well. But we have to broaden this conversation. And we don't have, you know, so we, you, know, you mentioned Sharif el Meki and, right. and that work there. You know, so th there are these national movements around uh, the need for more Black educators. Mm -hmm. Well, in STEM, my goodness, <laughs> you know, we go from being a crisis to being hair on fire when it comes to STEM. <laughs> and, and the fact that there are uh, the, the lack of representation in STEM, in the science, technology, engineering, and math in education is, um, is critical. 
And even when we have these discussions, we often have discussions that talk about recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. You can't recruit or retain who's not there in the pipeline first. So we have to work on broadening that pipeline. Okay. We cannot uh, continue to try to import input talent from other places. Everyone wants to import talent. Yeah. STEM education becomes like the United States giving out those HB1 visas in order to import STEM talent, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're at the same spot in STEM education that we have to somehow get this outside talent in order to fill these spots. And when everyone's looking for a black or brown STEM educator, they're all trying to hire the same seven people mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the system hasn't said, oh, yeah, we need to have a, an economy. <laughs> we need to have this type of circular, circular economy within STEM education that wants to grow our own mm -hmm. and that we have a system that values those, those the STEM education as a part of the STEM enterprise. Right. right. The, the, the discussions are often you have STEM workforce and you have education, but guess what? Everyone who becomes part of the STEM education Thank workforce you. has a STEM degree. Thank you. They're coming through the exact same pipeline. So we have to think about what it means to broaden that pipeline so right. we can have more people who are intentionally going into the classrooms to be these professional STEM educators. And until, until more of us are, like you said, at the table who are making those policy decisions, often- Then we need they're, to they're, depend they're, upon and if we're not, those and, allies. If we're, and if we're not look, if, if we're not using that lens, right, to to address the issues, then it's going to stay the same. It's going to, stay, and, and that's why we need to continue to develop everyone in the systems. Right. And so the uh, equity cultural competency work isn't just for new and emerging folks. No. It's for the people who are there currently because they are the ones who are making the decisions, the policies. They are setting up the conditions uh, for this work to occur. And those are the teachers who are currently in front of these students who are either going to be someone who is going to promote them up to the next level or be a barrier to them getting to where they could go. Yeah. And, and inspire them, right? Because they have, they, they, they're, they're approaching them as if, yes, you have every opportunity. I think I've heard you say, you know, you, your, your, your goal um, is, is around making, making STEM a right, not an exception, right? So well, it's, well, and I, yes. may, I know I'm misquoting you. That's I know okay. that's a misquote. Um, so STEM, STEM is a right. Access to high quality STEM is a right, not a privilege. Privilege. Thank you. That's it, right? And and so again, very similar to you know Nimsy's approach around around this work is that every every student has the opportunity should have the opportunity. Um, and, and so, you know, I think it, it, again, just kind of circle back to some of the things that you were saying there around, you know, having sort of those, those, um, the skills, the, the, the analysis, the critical analysis skills that are necessary, which often we, we relegate to like literacy is one of the reasons why NIMSI includes, you know, English as mm -hmm. part of the, like the, the, the foundational skills that we, that we need in order to excel. Any, in anything. Um, I want to pivot just a second, though, because I know, you know, one thing that's on a lot of people's minds right now is the impact that the pandemic has had on this work. Um, can, can you, I mean, ha, ha, what type of impact has it had on the work that you, that you very specifically that you're doing um, and, and the ways that you're trying to, you know, sort of bridge those gaps in, in, in this area? So here, here's the second shout out to uh, Cheryl. Okay. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things that Cheryl coined early on, and we got to do some sessions on this, was the pandemic uh, gave us the ability or the opportunity to help think about, people think about recovering forward. So um, if we think about what that means, that if we're saying, and we look at all data and say that pre-pandemic, the uh, opportunities and, and the, the data for uh, black and brown students is already pretty bad, you know, mm -hmm. across the country. Um, and people are saying, well, we need to get back to normal. Well, well, normal kind of sucked for a lot of people. And so we can't say normal is the baseline we want to get back to. Yeah, we need to get back to a sense of normalcy. But then we need to learn from the pandemic and all the things that we learned about uh, just where all the weaknesses and pressure points are in the system in order to get past that. So the pandemic needs to be a learning opportunity for us. 
Uh, we've we've shifted our models in so many different ways, and both in, in our educational delivery. So my professional okay. development delivery shifted, but our educational models have also shifted. And so we need to learn from that. And that just, you know, yeah, we want to get back to in-person instruction. But what are the things that we learn about distance instruction and the resources that are involved there that can add a richness to those classrooms? And also, we need to be really, really uh, careful that we don't say, well, we, we have lost, you know, a year, uh, that those students are, are you know, they, 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 the die is cast for them. And so we're just going to have to go back and kind of do a you know, redo around that. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's be intelligent about it. You know, we, we have information. We have diagnostics. We have all these things we can do, all these tools we can use in order to say, all right, well, here's where the students are. So now, now we have a better picture of where they are. Let's mm -hmm. develop a set of plans together within a school, within a system, in order to move those students along to the next level where we know they should be going. But we have intelligent tools that are going to tell us that. Mm -hmm. The pandemic is horrible, but there's learning that can come out of it for educators that we need to really um, take stock in the things that it's taught us about how we deliver uh, a sound education to students it's and not like just culturally, rush back. Uh, it's almost like a culturally relevant, like pedagogical approach, right? It's like almost, well, yeah. <laughs> almost. I mean, it's it's you know, it, it's as far as like understanding where where you are right now. Like this is the situation, and and what do we? How do like you said? How do we learn from this? Um, you know, you, you, I I and, and I don't want to minimize. I mean, no. honestly, you know, because there there are, there are some disparities. There, there are systems that have been fully back in place the entire time and, and, and really didn't miss a beat. And then there are students that are not, aren't getting provided uh, an adequate education because of a lot of different circumstances, the lag and getting them technology and all those right. other and all those other things. Uh, but so so those are those are realities. Mm -hmm. But even in the distant spaces where we're working, there are rich. There's a richness of resources that we can utilize. And then those same types of resources can be utilized as we transition back into full-time learning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what's what's next? Um, what's next for the STEM Equity Alliance? Like what you know, what as as you think about moving forward? I mean, you're already moving forward, like you said. Like, but but what what do you see? Yeah, we're still trying to get 1.0 down. But, okay. Um, <laughs> no, no, I mean. We always have to have a 2.0 mind, and and you know there have been quite a few things that are on on the table for us. Um, the partnerships we're developing, the richness of those partnerships, um, will allow us to do some some different things and and move from um, you know operating within ourselves to operating more within our partnerships and expanding our reach there. So, okay. um, you know the the challenge of and this is one of those things where our board the other day was very clear. Uh, you know, the, the ability to write and publish and, and so turn the trainings from being us to the trainings being manuals. And, and, and so we have information we can share uh, and that people can access. And so part of that is needing the resources to do that because often when we are doing work, people are paying for our time, but not necessarily infrastructure. And so mm -hmm. we need to focus on infrastructure issues in order to be able to uh, spend time writing and publishing and, and those types of things. So that's, uh, that's one of our infrastructure challenges as well. Um, and, you know, taking a look at this model, you know, that, that this five-part model we have, and actually uh, doing some real solid academic research around it. Um, you know, Can you just speak real quick to that, to that in, yeah. in like a 30-second, like, sound? Sure. Bit. I mean, all, yeah. all it is, is we, we need to take it and put it into a system where we're looking at it from a research standpoint, uh, that, that it has some dollars tied to it to say, if you do these things with fidelity, then this will be the outcome and to push the push on those ideas. So, you know, and, and for validity, for, you know, for the, for the right. sake of it being a real research tried and true model that has um, some some validity and the metrics tied to it, we need to go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay. So what 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 would you what advice um, would you give or do you give you talked about the pipeline, right? Building that pipeline of STEM professionals. What what advice do you give to students or young and or young STEM professionals um, who are sort of seeking those other opportunities? Like you said, you thought medicine, you thought you wanted to be a doctor, and then you were like, "Yep, no, it was the lifestyle. It really wasn't that. That was not the way I wanted to 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 make an impact." What, what 
what advice would you give these folks who are seeking opportunities outside of those traditional pathways? Um, I think one thing that, you know, I, I do work, I, another organization, uh, the uh, National Institute for Inclusive Competitiveness. And uh, we focus a lot on entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial spirit and, and what that actually means to develop systems that recognize entrepreneurship as being real and valued. Um, I, I said something early on about being institutionalized and we still have a very institutional model where we say, you know, go from K-12 to, you know, college to another institution or to a career. And we don't say, hey, you know, go from K-12, understand what it means to, you know, what your passions are, what your skill sets are. If you want to go to college, that's fine. Go to college in order to use that, in order to build a, 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 a brand for yourself, to build your businesses, to invest in your own development in ways that may start off in the corporate world, but then you can take those skill sets and develop uh, things where you're actually uh, become a, an, an employer, um, where, where you're going to, um, you know, in, in the black community, uh, our jobs and our, our our businesses are often service industry businesses. And for, so for those folks who are in the STEM field, it's like, so what does it mean to be part of this innovation economy? And how can you be a part of the innovation economy, a part of the tech economy? How can you be part of uh, this fourth industrial revolution uh, where, you know, the fourth industrial revolution is the, uh, you know, uh, Mike Green would tell me, it's, it's the, um, the acceleration of obsolescence. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are things which are disappearing at light speed. Mm -hmm. um, so how are you going to go ahead and create industry within this economy mm -hmm. and stand up things uh, within the communities that are taking advantage of everything, every opportunity, you know, opportunity zones all over the place. So if there's an opportunity zone, are you going to then develop a business in an opportunity zone that is going to then be part of a larger industry, you're going to be part of uh, some other hub, or you're going to be a job creator and helping people. I mean, young people are, you know, they, they have a young people, <laughs> they, they have a very different set of ideas. They're, they're not looking for gold watches anymore. No. Um, and because they are not, how do we help young people earlier in their careers understand what, who they are as an asset and how they can build an economy or how they are valuable in building the economy? Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, as, as we're closing out and I, and I want to leave time in case um, there are some, some questions, I would be remiss, right, if, if I, you know, did not mention, we mentioned the fact that, that we, you know, both from the same city. Um, and I know one of the things that influence has, has a, an impact on the way that I show up um, has been obviously the experiences that I've had and very specifically, you know, having gone to a single sex high school where, um, you know, the expectation as a, as a young woman was that we would excel and, you know, in, in whatever area we decided, but that we were comfortable with who we are. And, and when we were at the table, we knew we were at the table because we deserved to be at the table. And then mm -hmm. to matriculate then to another single sex HBCU, shout out to Spelman College. Um, that was, you know, that what, what the, the, the high school was a, was a white high school, right? And then I go to an HBCU where there is that added level of, you know, understanding of who I am. Um, you talked a little bit about your origin story specifically around like your family, but um, I'm, I'm assuming, yes, there is some, some connection there as far as, you know, the, your, your, your formal education and how it's impacted um, you particularly. Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, over one shoulder here, you see yep, Howard University, see the other shoulder, you see the Steelers. Yeah. That, that tells you everything you need to know. There it is. You know, about what's important. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm not a first generation college student. So like I said, that's that's an important factor. Um, the HBCU world, the HBCU community, uh, of course, is rich and deep in my family as well. I, I mean, I followed in my big sister's footsteps in, in going to Howard University and I had cousins who went there. I have 
uh, you know, uncles and aunts who attended Howard University, but also we can go through another list of other schools which they attended as well, mm -hmm. um, many of which were HBCUs and provide, provided just a hugely important foundation for us. And, um, you know, I, 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 of course, I am very biased uh, about the value okay. and the power of an HBCU, yeah. but there is something about that identity formation uh, that they, they do help to foster. Um, you know, it, it is something about the uh, excellence that they have an expectation for uh, and that you are not an exception because you are there. You're there because you are supposed to be there mm -hmm. and everyone who's around you uh, is there you know, with the same mentality and mindset that we have this collective approach to, uh, you know, becoming better and transforming mm -hmm. uh, our communities. And uh, I think that those values are, are deeply ingrained in who, and in, you know, in, the HBCU, um, you know, that, that is part of their identity. That is mm -hmm. definitely part of their mission and what they want to create in, in the students and, and the, uh, what they want the alumni to be as they leave. Yeah. Um, you know, so right now I have, you know, two of my sons, one is a, um, you know, Morehouse grad, you know, so mm -hmm. right there uh, with, you know, sister to the university center. brother <laughs> universities. Uh, another is at my alma mater right now. He's at Howard University. Um, and, and so, you know, being able to pass those traditions along and, you know, I, I have my other son, you know, this is my second son. He chose a PWI and he chose it for reasons that, you know, made a lot of sense. Um, and he's gotten a great education there. He has great value and affection for uh, what the institution has done for him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that pathway is fine. However, the HBCU pathway, uh, and, and we're, you know, we, we can give all the shout outs to everyone who was on the national stage over the past, um, over the past year with the election. Uh, and now we have a vice president from an HBCU who was put there by uh, two other you know, HBCU mm -hmm. alum kind of put her over the top. And That's so right. we had that, you know, Howard and Spellman and FAMU type connection going on. And, and so, I mean, it's, it's an important legacy. And when it comes to the STEM legacy, when it comes to this legacy of professionals. I was going to uh, say, if you, you could know, speak to that. That, yeah. that STEM legacy in HBCUs is, I mean, not even legacy, the, the, the current STEM landscape, when we look at the number of engineers uh, and doctors who are still coming out of HBCUs, um, that, well, they still are transforming the landscape of the United States. Mm -hmm. And so um, the HBCU world, and that's why I do work to support the HBCU world because, um, you know, that, that's, going, that's going to continue to be our, our, our lifeblood. That's going mm -hmm. to continue to be a strong foundation, even though we have the ability to go to other institutions. And by and large, that's where we do attend because those are now open for us. But HBCU still, uh, they, they, they are, they're still outperforming uh, and they're, you know, um, they're fighting above their weight as far as their productivity. Right. And we can't ignore the type of productivity that's coming out of them at this point. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, this has truly been a pleasure. Um, I, you know, I don't, again, I don't, uh, shall I ask our moderator, did we have any questions that we should be addressing? At this time, there are none in the chat. Okay. Okay, great. I just want to make sure because right, I'm looking. I, I know we're we're about at time. Um, Arthur, this is this has been fun. Um, I you know I I know we will have an opportunity to to work together some more. Really excited about what that might um, might might bring, and I'm and I'm so glad that we've had this chance to um, you know have this conversation, allow other people to kind of take a look in at what you're doing in the in the the tremendous work um, and impact that uh, STEM Equity Alliance, as well as your other, if you have lots of connections um, and, and lots of, of um, you're, you're, you're in lots of different places. So um, I, I really, really do appreciate this. I know a lot of people have gained a lot from this. And, um, and, I, and again, I just, I just wanna thank you for, for this time, this, this last hour, it's been great. Well, once again, thank you for this opportunity. Um, like I said, I, I... I'm humbled by it. I don't take it lightly, um, and I know I'm I'm one voice out there in the in the sea of voices, and so I was just happy to be able to share my experiences and my perspectives. And um, you know, I do look forward to our continued work together because um, there's definitely no shortage of work to be done. 
Yeah, that's for sure. Thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in um, in this installment of our STEM Pathways Conversations. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye.